So help me out here. I'm trying to make a list, a list of all the people in Scripture that decent church folk tried to avoid. Here's what I have so far. I want you to help me check these off. Tax collectors and sinners, they're a no-go. That includes prostitutes, adulterers, certainly murderers and thieves. Want to stay away from them. Foreigners, especially Samaritans. The poor, which includes the hungry and the houseless. We want to add any unproductive member of society, like widows and orphans, really all children. They're not good for anything. The diseased, this is, would include lepers, the blind, the deaf, the lame, anyone generally paralyzed, definitely the demon-possessed. Anyone else? Can you think of anybody else? We don't want to leave out the ones where we're supposed to leave out, so let's make sure we get them all on this list. I think it's a pretty good sampling what we have so far. If you come up with anything else, type it in the comments if you have an option to do that. There's, there's just one problem, though, when I, when I look back over the list. These are the very people Jesus went out of his way to spend time with. These are the very people Jesus loves. As a matter of fact, if, you, if you're looking through Scripture, the Gospels in particular, these stories we have of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can't read more than a couple paragraphs without Jesus Loving on somebody that's already on our list. Loving people, good church folk claimed were unlovable. Now, I'm trying to be more like Jesus. I'd, maybe, maybe you're doing the same thing. Maybe you want to be more like Christ. So I can agree, at least in principle, that these folks that we've just named, all, of the, all the unlovable folks, are people we're, we're supposed to spend time with. They're people that we are supposed to love. My struggle, perhaps yours as well, is that Jesus never stops with the ones that are relatively easy to love. No, Jesus says, draw your line, put who you want to love on one side and everyone else on the other. And then Jesus walks up to the line, crosses over, and says, come and love me here. There's a little dialogue that I imagine playing out as Jesus crosses over the line and starts hanging out with these unlovable folks, I say, come on, Jesus, them? Jesus says, yes. All of them? (laughs) Even, Even the ones I really don't like? Even my enemies? Especially your enemies. And what may be one of Jesus's, perhaps, perhaps uh, the most famous message that that Jesus offers about this way he invites us to live and to love, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus basically says, what good does it do to love the people who love you, the the ones that are easy to love? What good does that do? Anyone can do that. Real love extends to the ones we don't like, the ones who can't benefit us, the ones who may even be actively working against us. And the worst of these we call enemies. Enemies, the the ones we dislike, even hate, the ones we fear, the ones we don't want to be around, the ones who are anti-us. Enemies, those who passively or actively oppose our way of life. Their very existence may seem to pose a threat. Their very real actions may be harmful toward us. As hard as loving enemies is, I struggle with this idea. I suggest it is that very idea, though, and the practice of living it out that's the heart of Christianity. It's it's the heart of Jesus' message. You can be nice without involving Jesus. You can do good things in the world without connecting those actions to God. You can find friends and meaning and purpose beyond participating in a church. But loving your enemies, I believe that that invites a a different way of living in the world that is not only countercultural, I I don't know that it makes any sense unless loving your enemies is a response to the love we receive from God. Put another way, when we gather together, even in this format, even in this way, when we come together together, 
what, what, we're, what we're about isn't primarily about loving the lovable, loving those we like or, or, or who can help us or who we enjoy being around. Think, think about the people you spend the most time with, right? When I'm talking about living this life of Christ, it's not primarily about hanging out with folks that you just get along with. No, when we come together, when we become the church, we do so because we are enemies of God. We rebel against God. We have chosen our own paths, and God has loved us anyway. God loves us into relationship, is patient with us, and helps us understand a better, a different way. Sometimes we're even enemies of one another. We, however, are invited to to practice love the way we might come to understand ourselves differently, that we could be invited to love as we have been loved. You see, it's not, this, this life of following Jesus is not about being nice. It's more than being friendly. It's not an exchange where we give a little time or a little money and we get some kind of warm fuzzy in return. It's not picking and choosing the things or the people who make us feel special or important or comfortable. It may be an unpopular opinion, as we say, but it wasn't any more unpopular with the religious, it wasn't any more popular, rather, with the religious folk of Jesus' day. Some tried to find a loophole that would allow them to dismiss Jesus and his message. This message of this kind of radical love, this, this world-changing, countercultural love. They tried to dismiss him and his message. It went a little something like this. Again, we read from the gospel according to Matthew, this story we have of Jesus here in the New Testament. Here in the 22nd chapter, beginning with the 34th verse, we hear this. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him, being Jesus, with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. This idea of testing Jesus, of, of trying to, to figure out uh, this loophole, I, I, I just say these rascally Pharisees. You see, they thought if they could get Jesus to name one rule, one commandment as being the most important, that's how they phrase the question, what's the most important commandment? They thought if they could get him to name one rule, that they could bring up then hundreds, because they literally had hundreds of rules. And if he said one was the most important, they could bring up all these other examples and say, well, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? That they would have argued was just as important and in that way, prove that Jesus was just a radical trying to stir up trouble. Well, Jesus is a radical if you're intent on enforcing rules that allow you to benefit from the suffering of others. Jesus is trying to stir up trouble if you're abusing the very people God has invited you to champion and to love. Try as they might to ignore Jesus, Jesus will not be ignored he will not be shushed. He will not be complicit. To his critics, Jesus does something so simple and yet so profound. He makes the complex. He takes all of the system of rules. He makes this complex system simple without losing its meaning or its power. He says, basically, name a law, and I'll tell you the root of that law. Name a law, and I'll set it on a foundation that it's meant to be built upon. Take all of your rules, he says, and they all boil down to, they can all be simplified down to this one idea, love God. And if you're going to love God, it looks like loving your neighbor. Right, it's it's really it's it's very profound. It's 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 a masterful stroke. It's it's a way, and I mean, we have already heard he silenced the Sadducees, right? And he's going to stymie the Pharisees. As, as he relates everything down to this idea. If everything comes down to loving God, 
That's, that becomes troublesome for the Pharisees because that's what Jesus has been, has been saying. He says, all, all, the, all the things that you're concerned about, all the things you're worried about, all the things you're focused on, you've missed, you've missed it. <laughs> you've missed the big picture, loving God and loving others. You can't say that you do one or the other without doing them both. I think we struggle with this today. I know that I do. I want to put a little qualifier in there, a little descriptor, a little descriptor that makes it a little bit more palatable. When we're talking about loving your neighbors, I want to say, okay, but love your kind neighbor, right? I get that. Love your helpful neighbor. Yes, I'm on board. Love your polite neighbor. No arguments. But Jesus says, no, it's love God and love your neighbor, period. So for us, here's what I want us to, to think about. Here's what I want us to focus on. We're going to have these qualifiers. Love your fill-in-the-blank neighbor, right? We're going to put some kind of descriptor in there. That's what we naturally do. But let's just, let's just agree at this moment. Let's, let's, the point I, I hope that you can hear me trying to make is this. Whatever we do to fill in that blank counts. We're, we're to love that neighbor too. So however you describe it, kind or polite or generous, love your actual neighbor. So we want to love the addicted neighbor, the lonely neighbor, the angry neighbor, the annoying neighbor. We are invited. I like that a little bit better than commanded. But command is also true. To love the Muslim neighbor, the Jewish neighbor, the transitioning neighbor, the convicted neighbor, the political neighbor, the immigrant neighbor neighbor, the disabled neighbor, the obese neighbor, the millennial neighbor. Love your however you fill in the blank neighbor. All of them. We're, we're to love them all. The neighbors then that we are called to love will, should, must include those that we don't like, those whom we may even name as enemies. <laughs> I mean, I think you can follow that, right? If we, if we run out of all the, the good descriptors, right, all the, all the helpful descriptors, all the ones that we feel comfortable with descriptors, we will eventually start getting to some people that we don't like, some people that we perhaps are even opposed to or we believe they're opposed to us, our enemies. And they are supposed to be loved as well. As Stephen Covey says in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Habit number two is begin with the end in mind. So beginning with the end in mind, we want to be more like Jesus. Jesus invites us to love our neighbor, all neighbors, every descriptor you can come up with. So beginning with the end in mind, we're going to love even our enemies. Let's recognize that, that that's going to be difficult. That's going to be hard. So, so let's not start with loving enemies. Let's give ourselves a little bit of grace. Let's take a step back. Let's just start maybe a little, a little bit more easily. Let's, let's start with the neighbors that are easier to love. Begin at the beginning, knowing where we're going to go. Let's begin right where we're at. We don't have to begin at the ending, right? We begin with the end in mind, but we start right where we start. If we're going to love our enemies, let's take steps toward that end. Let's start easy, giving ourselves grace, loving the lovable ones as we practice the rhythm of grace. So we're going to practice being kind and gentle and patient. We're going to practice being, being people who care for others. We're going to practice sharing joy and laughter. We're going to practice offering encouragement and support. We're not going to have it all figured out, right? So at the beginning here, we're going to say we're going to take a step toward the end we have in mind, loving our enemies as Jesus loves us, as Jesus loves our enemies. But we're going to start by, by putting into practice these ways that love is, is made known, the ways that love is manifest, kindness and gentleness and self-control and encouragement and support and care. And maybe, maybe the best place to start practicing that kind of loving, that, that, you know, taking steps toward becoming more loving, maybe the best place to start is with the people around us, our actual neighbors. Maybe, maybe what would be helpful is if we just began with getting to know the people 
immediately around us, our actual neighbors. So as we begin this, this series, as we, as we start thinking about what it looks like for us to love our fill-in-the-blank neighbor, right, loving our actual neighbor, let's just start by getting outside and saying hello. If, if, you, if you do not yet know the people who live around you, the people who are closest to you, start there. Just say hello. Just introduce yourself to your neighbor. Maybe you could then pray for and prepare for opportunities to, to take another step, a next step, maybe to introduce yourself. So maybe you just start with hello, and you're going to pray for, and you're going to prepare for, you're going to get ready for an opportunity to present itself for you maybe to introduce yourself, to learn who your neighbor is and to share who you are, to begin this, this relationship to share some part of your life, to learn some part of their life. It really is that simple. When we talk about taking a step toward loving our enemy, again, friends, we're not going to jump to loving our enemy. If you can do that, hallelujah. I want to suggest for most of us that that's really hard, very difficult. Let's, let's not try to jump to that. Let's take a step to becoming more loving with people that are easier to love. And we're going to grow in love. We're going to practice love. We're going to get better at loving, taking steps, right? Having the end in mind. We know where we want to go, taking the small and simple steps to get there. Love God and love your, just, just answer it however you will, neighbor. This, this week we're going to be starting Neighbor's Week. Whenever you're going to be watching this, imagine that to be Neighbor's Week. And, and what we mean by Neighbors Week is an intentional week in which we're going to, to actively be, be present in our neighborhood. We're going to actively try to engage our neighbors. We're going to pray about and look for opportunities to, to grow as neighbors. We're going to try to love our neighbors in real and tangible ways. We're going to put messages out on the sidewalks. We're going to bake cookies and treats and deliver them. We're going to say hello. We're going to find ways to care for one another. We're going to look for opportunities, right? So whatever kind of neighborhood you're in, take a week where you are just intentional about paying attention to the people around you, where, where you can find opportunities to practice love. Pray about that. Look, look for the opportunities. Just take a small step. And friends, here's, here's what I want you to hear me say at the, as, as we think about this neighboring idea. We're, we come back to this all the time. If you're like me, you think, well, this is where I am right now, and this is where I want to be, and you just try to jump to the end. Again, if you can do that, great. But I think a, a more likely series of events is for us just to take a step, just to grow slowly if you can get other people to do this with you, even better. Get a group of folks that can support you in this, an intentional week of neighboring. Here at North Cross, we've created neighbor kits. There are physical tools that, that you could use. But if you're not in the Kansas City metro area, if you're, if you're not able to get a physical kit, I want to invite you to go to the North Cross website at playlearnshare.org backslash neighbors, and there's a whole series of downloadable resources that you could use wherever you are. Playlearnshare.org backslash neighbors. Take a look at some of the tools there. Experiment, explore, try it out. Love your actual neighbor. Love your fill-in-the-blank neighbor. Eventually, we'll look up one day and we'll say, we have, have loved as Jesus has loved. But until that day, let's just take a step. First step, let's pray. Would you pray with me? The gracious God, if we have believed or been taught or, or somehow have been living out the idea that, that following you is all about what we get from you, that somehow you have come to earth, You've, you, you're here to, to make us comfortable. If, if we've believed that in any way, then God, I pray that you'll, you'll soften our hearts and open our minds to understand that's never been your purpose. 
Yes, you love us. Yes, you invite us into relationship so that we could love others, so that that love could transform the world. For all the ways we've turned following you into a club or, or some kind of a, a, a status or a, a social experiment or a way to gain friends or influence, we repent of that, God. We turn back, we turn away from that, and, and we pray that as we learn more about your love, as we take up this call to love as you love, as we move closer to loving our enemies, the heart of your message, we pray, God, that you'll help us. Show us the, the right times and the right things to say and and, and, and God, maybe just free us from the idea that there has to be a right time or a right thing. Maybe, God, you could just give us a, an openness to say at any time or at any place, if there's a, a way to be a, a neighbor, that you'll, you'll help us in that. Show us how we can be encouragers and supporters and and those that offer a, a different way of living in this world, a way that points others to you. That they too might come to love as you've loved. We pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.